Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. You may have listened to one or more of the shows from our AI and consumer electronics series last week. There's a ton of interesting work happening in that space, but the reality is that I came back from CES both excited and also somewhat disillusioned about personal AI. Don't get me wrong, there's a bunch of cool stuff coming for sure, but it's taking so long. In the meantime, the privacy sacrifices we're being asked to make for modest conveniences seem pretty steep at times. I wanna know what you think about the state of personal AI. I really wanna hear from listeners on their thoughts, experience, and desires on the role AI is playing in your home and personal life, your favorite examples of home or personal AI, the home or personal AI that you really wanna see in your lifetime, and just where you see this all going. Please check out twimmelaicom slash myai to share your thoughts. We've got some really great entries so far, and you can check them out on that page, but we're missing a very important one, yours. Let me know your thoughts, and you'll be automatically entered into the running for some great prizes. For today's show, I'm joined by Nyaling Morosi, Senior Data Science Researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, or CSIR, in Pretoria, South Africa. We discuss two major projects that Nyaling is a part of at the CSIR. One, a predictive policing use case, which focused on understanding and preventing rhino poaching in Kruger National Park. And the other, a healthcare use case, which focuses on understanding the effects of a drug treatment that was causing pancreatic cancer in South Africans. Along the way, we talk about the challenges of data collection, data pipelines, and overcoming sparsity. This was a really interesting conversation that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Let's do it. All right, everyone, I am on the line with Nyaling Morosi. Nyaling is a senior data science researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, or CSIR, in Pretoria, South Africa. Nyaling, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be on today. Uh, and I'm happy to have you on. Um, I got a chance to hear your talk at the uh, Black and AI workshop at NIPS, and you are doing some really amazing work. And I'm uh, looking forward to learning even more about it. Uh, but before we get into what you're up to nowadays, why don't you spend a little bit of time telling the audience about your background and how you got involved in data science and machine learning? All right. Um, so I am actually uh, originally from Lesotho, um, and, uh, but I did most of my university in the U.S. So I went to McAllister College for my undergraduate. Uh, I was going to be an econ major because all the cool kids were doing it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I know, and I got distracted halfway through. Um, so, yes, in, in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay. Uh, I decided during my degree uh, that, you know, I ought to know a little bit more about computing um, mm. in order to be a really good economist, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then the bug caught. Uh, I was just, <laughs> I just couldn't stop. I took an AI class in undergrad and I was taught by this really brilliant woman, Susan Fox. I'm completely plugging her in right now, shamelessly. Um, she was completely brilliant uh, and I was just wowed by it and the area. Uh, but generally, the whole reason I was into econ to even start with was because I was really obsessed with trying to understand things like, why do things happen the way they happen? Why do people do the things they do? And for what I, as far as I knew, economic theory was one of the best ways to describe why people do the things they did. Mm -hmm. But then when I got into AI and the modeling of AI, and then later on, uh, in, uh, I went to, for my PhD, which is very unfinished, I went to University of Minnesota and I was doing machine learning. Um, then it was also, you know, the development of these models that can help you not only observe, uh, which sometimes, you know, in econ, you observe and then you plan back, but right. also try to model these things and try to extract these features that explain to you. And, and if you can, 
you know, in mechanical uh, design, mechanism design, you know, the whole thing of like, if you can just tweak it a little bit, you can get the output you want. That mm -hmm. really got me very interested. <laughs> so overall, I, I will say I am a true student of liberal arts. So my machine learning is tainted by econ, is tainted by bio biology, uh, and it's tainted by a couple of other things. Um, so, But I, I've always just wanted to know how things work, the way they work, why they work, the way they work. And I love patterns. I love just discovering what's embedded in a process. And yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, the more and the deeper I get into, you know, the uh, machine learning AI and the kind of the opportunities around it, the more I am convinced that, you know, everyone, you know, we need people from a very broad cross section of backgrounds yeah. who understand this yeah. and are working on it and can kind of, br you know, both, you know, bring their perspectives to it, but also apply it to, you know, their disciplines. And only yeah. in doing that, can we really advance this to where it needs to be? No, I agree with you. I, I actually think um, it, it's in the problem that the worth of the, of, of these processes is. I mean, the mathematics can be really beautiful and understand this, the, 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 the structures under. But when you sit in an area and, and you're able to dissect an area and actually apply it, uh, I've always been drawn to that kind of machine learning. So very, um, applied. I, I, I like seeing the results. Mm -hmm. What is CSIR? Oh yeah, CSIR. So it's I think in the US it'd be called the government lab. Um, okay. so a national lab just, we have uh, a national lab, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, so it's just this campus and we've got different units. We've got nanocenter where they study nanoparticles and the applications, biosciences, and these are the biologies, the wet labs. Okay. We've got security, we've got so it's it's a bunch of uh, research lab, national uh, research labs, and we serve both the government and industry. Okay. And academia, actually, <laughs> Okay. sometimes. Uh, and so what, what are some of the types of projects that you get involved in there? Yeah, so uh, going back to my all ever so curious, um, I've been <laughs> uh, in, I know, I've been, but I do try to, to segment them. But I've been in a couple of, of uh, projects. And maybe just for today, I'll talk about just the two of them, one that I'm currently working on and one that I just recently parted with a little bit. Um, so some of, one of the projects that we worked with uh, was an understanding uh, rhino poaching. So uh, I, I have a feeling a lot of people will be aware of this, that there is a huge problem in, in rhino poaching. Um, mm -hmm. And so we were contracted by the South African Park Rangers uh, who are the guys that police uh, the parks in South Africa. And they contracted us to say, can you guys provide for us some model to understand how these poachings happens? And if there's any way that maybe we can have a sort of predictive system that we can work with uh, to just cut down on the search space. Uh, so we worked with them. We were contracted to go work uh, at the Kruger National Park, okay. which is a fairly big uh, national park. It's the size of Israel. Yeah, Kruger is uh, and huge. So, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it spans like all the way into Mozambique. It's, it's, it's on the border with South Africa and Mozambique. So it's fairly big. But we work with one of the units here in, in, in uh, at the CSIR that does uh, security. Uh, okay. And we just, we were building a model to sort of try to narrow down a, like a, pro, a probability distribution map over the land. So to say, you look at the different features there as in, Things like when was the last poaching, how far from water, what's the weather like, what's the moonlight like, how far from the road, and things like those, or how dense is the forestation, and try to put all those features and see how much each one of them contributes to an area being very high that, you know, a rhino is going to be poached there. And by doing that, then, you know, maybe the pucks can then be allocated there uh, in areas that we suspect there's going to be high poaching. Uh, obviously, uh, this is uh, this is a model that uh, can get quite compromised if somebody knows how it works, because then you know <laughs> you're shifting resources from one area to the other, and so right. then, you know maybe they'll, they'll attack. But rhinos are fairly territorial, and so like the poachings are going to happen around where they, they 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 are going to be, and so we study those things like how they migrate and 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 all of that kind of stuff. So that was a project that we did. Uh, it's currently running. Um, 
and it ended some early this this no oh, it's a new year uh, in 2017 <laughs> in March 2017. Okay. Um. So that was that. But currently, yes. You make that one that project sound so uh, easy, but when you kind of rattle off some of the features of this model, it strikes me that yep. that data is coming from all over the place, like lots of different data sources. Can you talk a little bit about? the you know the kind of the pipeline and the, the challenges associated with uh, that particular project yeah so we actually worked a lot with the experts so it was one of those models that like one was informed by data and the other one was informed by the experts um, to start off with we built this thing where as the rangers are patrolling they can start to input data okay. so for example data about you can see some of the leftover footsteps by maybe people that should not have been in the park because, okay. uh, you know, there will be some areas of the parks that are closed off, but also if they had been approaching, you can see like footsteps towards there. And so right. like that would be information that like a park ranger would would um, would input. But also the park does have sensors in there. Um, and so the sensors would be another, um, you know, input, data input. Uh, the park, we do have knowledge about where the water sources are and generally what uh the what like vegetation and uh what's the word like you know le the level like how steep it, it is how mountainous it is and stuff like that okay uh, and like how far from the road it is so there was already some of that data that was there because obviously this is a very important area in south africa mm -hmm. um so that information was there but that combined with literally the rangers just walking um in the park okay uh, because sometimes you know, something can be donated denoted as it's a water source but then the water is all gone if it hadn't been raining things like those you know then they would correct it uh, so it, we were continuously learning and and we actually have this it's, it's as, as a, it's continuously ingesting new data. So every day we get new data uh, from, you know, the last night patrols or, or things like those. Uh, we also get data from helicopters that will fly over. Um, yeah, so you're right. It came from multiple sources and we just put it together. Not just, but um, so <laughs> some of the problems that we run into here, one of the biggest problem actually that we ran into was a problem of statistics. And the problem is that we would have a, a lot of spots. So we, we, we had very sparse data. This mm -hmm. is a vast land. And so we will have a lot of areas where uh, we hadn't seen any data points, right? right. We, don't, we don't have any information on whether there had been a poaching or something like that. Uh, and we, we really could only predict based, you know, like everything else that there was no poaching we had to to also say whether there was no poaching because there can't be a poaching there or it just hadn't occurred yet. Okay. Yeah, so that was, the, I think the sparsity of the data was, was one of the things that uh, was quite difficult when we we're trying to generalize over the whole park. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, did, you, you, you do see it uh, change. Um, we, we did see the patterns change over the years. So, you know, that's why I go back to that thing of saying, you know, just because you haven't seen a poaching happen in an area doesn't mean that it's not going to be the next area of interest. Right, right. Yeah. How did you deal with attacking that uh, or overcoming that sparsity issue? Well, we, uh, <laughs> I don't know if we, this is cheating or what, but we, we did a lot of smoothing. So we did a lot of <laughs> okay. in order to extend it out. But uh, you know what, though, I have to say this. It, it turned out that it wasn't even the, the, the big problem with our model. It seemed it was pretty good. Uh -huh. um, so we had cut up the park into kilometer square grid. Okay. Um, it, it was pretty good. But it turned out that even at the granularity of kilometer square grid, it's still too difficult. Like a poaching can actually happen in the square. We said it would happen. Mm -hmm. um, and they would still not get the poachers. Ah, it, okay. And so Meaning had it was to that, make it that even, granularity was even too big. Ah, even that. And and this is I, I think we were working, I think overall it's like 30 square kilometers, and we broke it down into kilometers, and even that wasn't wasn't good enough in terms mm -hmm. of truly pinpointing this in order to make it um effective enough. So I you know, it's one of those where you're like, that's I mean, sometimes it worked, but then it it it, it was that that part of it was a bit uh, difficult because it's like, oh, you know, you were so close, 
Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and our model certainly took that into effect because for us, our model punished a lot more if we miss a poaching, right? right uh, than right. Um, and if we say there's going to be a poaching and the poaching doesn't happen. So those are some of the things that we had to take care of, uh, even like, you know, making sure that the cost truly reflects the outcome that we want. And was the, you talked about the granularity in terms of the area, but what was the granularity in terms of time? Like, how did you, did, did you, were you trying to predict yeah. that uh, poaching might happen in a given day or week or month? It was a day. Okay. So like I said, we were getting updated data every day. And so the predictions were daily Okay. with the new data. Yeah. And did you find that the predictions in terms of um, area vary dramatically day to day or were they relatively static? Yeah, um, the shifts would take a little bit longer. Uh, so the migration pattern in terms of where the poachings would happen would actually shift a little, like would take multiple, uh, multiple days to actually move. But like I said, that's the problem. Um, if you say, you know, it's going to happen in this grid and then like next is going to happen in the next grid or, you know, um, it was still around the same area. So the policing mm -hmm. wasn't mm -hmm. as bad. But once again, it's the limited resources that the park rangers have. It's the danger of the job. Right. You can't just stay in plain sight. Right. I mean, just because you are there doesn't mean that they're going to stop poaching. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and so there were some of those things that actually, you know, really complicated uh, the problem. But you know what? I have to say this, and <laughs> maybe this is a little bit of a plug. It was, um, it was very interesting work. It was very useful work. And if there's people, I know there's work like this happening in Kenya. There are groups mm -hmm. that are doing the same thing around poaching in Kenya. And, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, it just needs, maybe needs more manpower because it's, it's the only way to truly beat it because it's a social problem. As long as the incentives are there, I mean, right, the right. amount of money that gets made by poaching is enough for somebody to risk their life and go to jail mm -hmm. and or go to jail. Right. So that's the, that's the thing. That's why I'm saying like, even when we made it fairly difficult, there would still be occurrences. Right. And, and, and it's mostly because of the geographical space. So, when this model runs in smaller spaces, so there were uh, privately owned farms around there, and those are not as big. And their problem there wasn't as bad because, okay. you know, they're managing a smaller space. But given how big the space is, given the incentives, given that this is a project that goes between two countries, right. uh, you know, it, it gets very difficult to police. Right. Uh, but we, we, we learned a lot. And uh, the South African uh, park rangers are still using the tool. Uh, so they are still getting some value for it. So I always say sometimes when you're working with these real world problems, it's just cutting the search space. It's not finding the solution. It's cutting the search space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and and that, in this yeah. particular example, uh, you, we're talking about search space, both from a, a modeling perspective, but also yes. literally <laughs> la <laughs> the land perspective. Yes, the land mass, <laughs> literally. The, yeah, like... <laughs> <laughs> yes, in kilometer, right, right. <laughs> not in in, in bytes or no, it's in kilometers. So right, yes, right. But and um, yeah, but but yeah, that project um came to to well, our our contribution, my contribution in that project kind of came to an end when we 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 were done developing the model, um, and that was in March, uh, mm -hmm. and and pieces of those are published. Um, and, and then of course, like I said, the, the software was delivered to the, to the park rangers. And so I, I moved on from that one, from that project, uh, but it's certainly, certainly an interesting one. And it's been one where we actually have been contacted by other people, for example, the cash in transit robberies, um, hmm. you know, where they're saying, you know, can you tell us spatially, cause we've worked with spatial data now, especially, uh, you know, what are the chances that this one area is going to be a hot spot for the next uh, you know, hit on, 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 on a delivery. Um, okay. but, but yeah, because, you know, they all link up, um, eh, well, somewhat it's, it's different, but, but, you know, at least they have that spatial component. Right. Right. Interesting. Interesting. And so, uh, that one ended about a year ago, just over a year ago. Um, yeah. and yeah. so now you're working on what? 
So now I actually, uh, it's funny because my life sort of came full circle and I went back to biology. I know I did say that I started off as e- an economist, but people have to forgive me because like I say, I am a, I am a liberal arts student. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I actually have my undergrad is both computer science and biology. And then, you know, my oh, wow. PhD work was computer science, economics and bioinformatics a little bit. I was just doing a project. That's also why the PhD never got com- finished. There was just too much. There was <laughs> too much going on. Uh, but um, so uh, I got contacted by the biosciences group here at, at the CSIR. So these are the wet lab biologists so who actually run the experiments and run samples. Okay. Um, and uh, they had run uh, a project like last year, and that project was on uh, understanding uh, an effect of one HIV treatment drug. Uh, and they found that, you know, there were biomarkers in African populations that had not been studied uh, and were causing renal failure in the patients that were taking that specific drug. Hmm. Um, and so based on that, it was a signal that, no, actually, we really have to take this problem very carefully. So we we know that generally people have the same processes generally as human beings. Right. Um, but also there are some um manifestations of diseases that are race or geography dependent. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we wanted to, so South Africa is going through a whole thing. So there's, there's such a, an increase in cancer incidence in South Africa as is in the world over. Um, But there's several research that will show that the, the rates of these incidents incidences is actually different in different populations. So for example, Black men will have a higher incident rate of prostate cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, or, for example, it's a lot more difficult to detect breast, breast cancer in black women and actually in Latina women even more, um, mostly because of how dense the breast tissue is. Hmm. So there are some of these things that we know, that there are some differential biomarkers in different populations that make the disease manifest itself differently, and therefore the therapy ought to be different. Right. And so... We uh, decided um, to study uh, pancreatic cancer in African population, but specifically South Africans, which literature will show that they can be quite different. Uh, you know, they, they they can be quite genetically different from maybe let's say West African. So I want to make that clear: we're not looking at all people of African descent. Mm-hmm. One of the really biggest thing I have to say, so besides understanding this, these biomarkers, is actually just to create the data, make sure the data is out there. So there may be however much we get to in identifying these biomarkers in pancreatic cancer. Uh, But the most important thing is to create this data so that other researchers in the rest of the world can study the data. Because one of the biggest problems with diseases in African populations is that African populations are not usually included in medical trials. So there isn't enough information and enough data uh, to go about to see how things affect people of African origin. The same happens with the amount of genomic data that's out there, uh, mm-hmm. which, of course, also the amount of proteomic data. We are looking at proteomic data. So this is the data, this is the, the proteins um, that, uh, and actually it's, it's going to be peptides, um, but I'm going to stick with proteins just for the sake of, you know, just removing <laughs> that. It's not really complex, but, you know, just for, we're having a chit chat, right? Right, right, right. right. Uh, but anyway, uh, and the scientists hopefully will not kill me for saying proteins <laughs> when actually. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, we just want to collect, the, like, try to find some of these proteins and see if there are, some of them are actually biomarkers. Um, in this disease. And maybe it might actually help to say what actually a biomarker is because there's a technical definition of a biomarker. Uh, is that a biomarker has to be a protein that is related to a disease. It is actionable and it is measurable. So it is measurable enough that you can make a decision. Mm, okay. So there are So this is why we always talk about biomarkers, because if you can truly identify biomarkers, which means they are actionable, then you can hopefully start to think about drug uh, development um, or some kind of corrective thing, because you can clearly pinpoint it and you can take some action. And some of that action can just be that you can predict 
and say, if I see this biomarker, uh, I know it is differential, d- differentiated enough that I can actually predict your susceptibility to the disease or actually whether the disease or the stage of the disease. So that's what we wanted to do. We want to identify these biomarkers and then we want to populate this, um, this data set so that other mm. researchers have it. And for us to, we certainly want to find these biomarkers and pass them on to our own, um, you know, uh, drug development companies or, you, you know, we, we, right, it's right. a whole pipeline, this whole system. Yeah. So you've got doctors on one end and then you've got academic and research institute on the other. You've got drug companies and then it goes right back to the doctors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, 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 and we're working with the local hospitals here. That's where we're getting the samples. So we're getting the samples from the local hospitals here. Uh, in uh, most of them are in Johannesburg. Okay. Uh, we are in Victoria, but it's like 40 kilometers, 60 kilometers away from each other. So practically mm-hmm. close by. Maybe let's talk a little bit about that, uh, that initial element of collecting the samples and processing them and turning them into a data set that you can use. How, how do you go about that? Well, you get a sample and you have to prepare this sample. So, I mean, you know, like the doctor goes in and then they they diagnose you. Oh, that sounds bad. I'm sorry. It's always so morbid, this whole discussion. <laughs> uh, but, you know, like that, you know, there's cancer. Right. So uh, and then they, you know, then we ask, you know, when they are going to do biopsies and stuff like that, right? They'll have like a sample. Um, and so... We get this sample uh, and then it goes into a lab. It gets prepared. It gets run through a mass spec. And the actual process that we use is the SWAT process. It really is not that important, but it goes through mass spec. And then mass spec is going to tell us, you know, which proteins are present in this sample. It's also going to tell us uh, how much of each one of these proteins are present. And it's in that how much. Well, assuming, first of all, you can clearly and neatly say which proteins are, are, are present because that's a whole science of its own too. But then you then, after you've defined, you've, you've, you've identified them, then you find out how much of them are present um, in the sample. And then you are then, if, if you can find dif- differences between either a protein or a group of protein be- between the disease cells and the non-disease cells, then you can say that, you know, you're starting to get biomarkers for that specific disease. Mm. Now, some of the problems that we run into here is, so I actually had worked a little bit uh, with data, with genomics data, and anyone that has done like genomics data and done PCR, I mean, the whole point of PCR is to, what's it called, is to make more of it. I can't think of the word. Um, is to amplify. Uh, expression yes, or amplification. Yeah. Yes, you know, you can amplify DNA, right? Unfortunately mm-hmm. for us, you can amplify the protein. So the amount of sample you have is the amount of sample you have. Okay. So we always, you have like, so proteomics is one of these things that uh, reproducibility is a big thing. Um, and so also, you know, like the whole thing of like confidence in your results. So mm-hmm. there's whole statistical packages that are just developed Um to to do this because the sample will degrade but now you can't do anything and so you don't get as high a signal um so uh, yeah so one of the first thing actually we always do is to standardize our equipment so that when we do get the sample uh we try to get everything run as as quickly as possible i i know i've actually just gone into so many other things besides where we start <laughs> the question but hopefully there's a thread that runs through (laughs) well you know one of the things that um you know one of the things that comes up in this area is that the data collection itself is often pretty noisy Uh, and i'm wondering if that's something that you experienced and um you know how the how you dealt with that in your pipeline yeah, so we are actually just now starting to collect the data. So okay. you're right. We 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 get we get like by by like now this is a three year project, and so year one just passed, and so that was the data collection for the biologists. Okay. Uh, and then for us, it was to standardize the workflow. Uh, so that that then takes care of the, the 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 technical noise. So what they call what is it called? Like technical something. Anyway, I'm gonna call it technical noise because I can't remember. And I think for people in this audience, it makes sense. Um, but this is 
you know, given the tools that you are using, right? Mm-hmm. How much noise do you just get from those tools and, and try to measure that? So that's the first thing. But then, yes, we do have sample noise as well. And the thing generally, um, the thing you do in this area is to just try to get as many samples as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, which we can't always have, and maybe that's a good thing because I mean, not as many people have cancer. Mm-hmm. Um, but but then, of course, it it has those other uh, Im- implications. Um, but yeah, I mean, you just, I mean, like I say, it's it's just like any other statistical exercise. You just have to have more data in order to to be confident in your results. You have to have more data. You have to run the samples multiple times. Uh, mm-hmm. So for each sample, we run it multiple times and to, to, to find out, you know, the noise that's embedded in just that one sample and the variations that are in that one sample. And then we run it. Um, sometimes we run two samples at the same time and then look at like that, that are supposed to come from the same cluster. And then we look at like the variation of the protein there. Um, and then that will help, you know, at least there we know that they just ran through the same run. So at least the technical variation is not exactly there. Uh, and then we can just look at the sample variation. Uh, but this is the place. This is what biology is. You're right. Uh, it's always uh, it's always a variation. And so the, the only decisions you really can make is when your data is uh, sufficiently separated. Um, So one of the first things you do is just look at the means of the two samples. So you look at mean expression of the disease cell and you look at mean expression of the non-disease cell. Um, And then you compare the two means. And if, 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 for example, the standard error, you know, crisscrosses, you really have to go back and just work through your your workflow. So we Mm -hmm. just start off simple, simple as that. Uh, because then you can't tell. Obviously, there you can't draw in conclusions. But if we can start to see some of those differences, then we get a little bit more confident. And then we can start to see uh, per sample where each sample falls. And then we start to look at, you know, can we predict per sample? Um, and uh, But yeah, this is something that can uh, be one protein or it can be a combination of proteins. Is the process that would happen on the medical side the same as your process? Meaning you you got these uh, biopsy samples and you ran them through the mass spec to separate out all the proteins. Uh, is that how the absent uh, your data collection, is that how the disease would be diagnosed or would would it be like... Uh, a radiologist and imaging data and that kind of thing, a different kind of process? Oh, I, I think usually it is still the imaging part. That part, I have to also say, I don't know as much. I, I have absolute, everyone's, well, yeah. The, every, I have a lay, only a lay on knowledge on on how the diseases themselves are diagnosed. Okay. Um, like in the hospital itself. Because, yeah, I, I get to interact with the data once it's with the bioscientists um, and they, they run through. And all I, I do is help them um, standardize the equipment uh, and then later on to do the data analysis. Okay. And so the data that yeah. you get is already labeled as to whether the sample is cancerous or not? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes, we are. The thing is, we are getting, uh, yes. So after a patient has been diagnosed with a certain kind of cancer, then we get a sample. So if, you know, like you've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, then we get the sample from the pancreas. We also get a sample from the biofluids, which are like bloods and, mm-hmm. and, and the you know, lymph something. But yes, the biofluids. Mm-hmm. So that's the information that we get. And then, yes, that's the one that, that gets segmented uh, with the mass spec. Okay. The, and so you're you're kind of in this data collection process now. Have you started you and you've also started kind of exploratory um, work with the data, but you're pre yes. kind of the modeling stage. Yes, yes, uh, we we are definitely before that. So, like I had mentioned, that other study with urine data. Um, so we actually are using that data to sort of. Uh, standardize the um, the workflow, so all the way like to see how things shift uh, from you know the point of them getting segmented all the way until they get quantified, 
and start to, you know, to understand that. And then that way we understand our equipment and we understand what we need to change. So there are multiple workflows in proteomics, like multiple. Uh, there's SciEx, there's, there's open swath, there's, you know, there's transproteomic pipeline. And, and all of them really are like these pipelines. So, you know, it goes into mass spec and then it gets into another thing that's going to pick, uh, like a pick picker, like it's going to find all the areas that, that are present mm-hmm. and then it gets labeled and then it gets quantified. And then, you know, all of this. And then, like, we're still at the peptide level. And then we go to the good old string alignment. But what do they call in proteomics? Uh, we do alignment to try to figure out if you see this set of, of peptide, what's the probability that it's this protein? And then it gets labeled. Um, so that it's always a pipeline. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, all these tools in the pipeline are pieces of code and sensors that that come with their own variation and have to be standardized. So that's what we've been doing. Once we have that, once we have data that we think is good, um, that we think uh, we can trust, which will hopefully be at the end of this year. So the pro- the, the process of actual data analysis is going to be this year. Um, and then, then we can start really running uh, the, the biggest thing in this area is to do classification, right? Because mm-hmm. when, and extracting those features that put one sample one side over the other, because those are right. the biomarkers, right? Like right. they're gonna, those are the yeah, in this area, be like those features that are saying you're dis- it's disease or non disease. So for us, we are looking at it as a classification problem mm-hmm. uh, to put it on one side over the other. Uh, we are also very interested in actually just running a clustering problem, even on the data. So maybe this goes back to your question of so it comes labeled to maybe even see if like uh, are these expressions you know all that different can we when we cluster them are there you know like some similarities even between the disease and non-disease so you just cluster the whole data set and then hopefully we'll get the separation that these are the disease cells and they'll cluster together and these are the non-diseased you know and they'll cluster together. The data from both will cluster together. But you can do that. But that's a lot of the work that you do when you're just exploring your data. Mm-hmm. Um, the same thing, just, you know, like understanding the differences of the means. Uh, you go through and you just understand your data. And then, like, you know, like chopping up your data into blocks so that you're not observing some other phenomena. Let's say maybe you're just seeing uh, this disease only in like old people or something like that so that you can mix like, you know, old people and young people and still try to detect these uh, differences. It ends up being uh, something, uh, a process that has um, a lot of data. And um, I, I do think one other thing that makes the problem a little bit complicated is that actually in the whole process of running your mass spec and everything, though we might run to want, want to run as many samples as possible, remember I did say that the sample degrades. So we always have like a timeline of how much we can take to even run experiments. And that actually is one mm-hmm. of the things that limits how much data we can collect. So ideally we would collect as much as possible, but you know, uh, we get limited by that. It's not just that we get too few samples. It's also that the samples we have can degrade uh, and, and it can be difficult to uh, rerun them later, right. which actually um is why sometimes this process of swath is good because all it does is just breaks down everything all at once so it, without even necessarily needing to label it you don't need to pick it just segments everything so later on you can actually go back to the old samples um, and study them when you have more information of how to actually understand this data at least it will exist one question that occurs for me in thinking about the way you describe your your workflow, even like at the super macro level, right? Your the first year is um, spent on data collection and kind of refining this data workflow. And then you kind of transition to an analysis phase in the second year. Um, But often these two are like the overall process of getting to a model is very iterative and you end up, you know, tweaking the way you collect data and the kinds of data you collect and, you know, building out features and things like that. And I'm wondering how, uh, if that's something that you observe as well and how uh, you fit that into the way you work there uh, on this project. Uh, Yes, definitely. We definitely do run the problem of, getting to some point and then just not having the results that we wish to have, but, um, or just not having results that are, that, that are reliable. 
Uh, but yeah, so it won't mean that we will stop collecting data on year two and year three. That mm-hmm. data will keep coming. Uh, and so while we are running um, this analysis, we might find that actually we have to chuck away some of that data and have to inform um, the doctors on how uh, to collect the, the data. The nice thing is that, like I said, uh, this kind of of uh, this kind of study is not like we are breaking ground in the processes. It's right, not. Right. We are using processes that have been developed and we're trying to make them better. There's a lot of work to still like for improvement in this area, like technically. So mm-hmm. yes, we can contribute those kind of technical, uh, you know, like contributions. Um, but the processes, there are multiple studies, there are multiple universities that are doing the right, like, work in right. genomics and in cancer. So, you know, we we have an idea generally of how right. to prepare the samples, of how, you know, we, we have a lot of literature that we can lean on to. So hopefully, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, things will work out fine. And and generally, they really should. <laughs> right. le- I don't know what could be so different um, because we expect the difference is going to be in the population. Right. Uh, because in terms of collections and stuff like those, that we are just, it's standardized methods. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and that kind of brings us back full circle. Ultimately, the goal here isn't to, you know, pioneer some new you know approach to collecting the data or modeling it's rather to apply things that are fairly well understood but to a population that has been underrepresented and understudied exactly i'm thinking about the you know the conversations that i've i've had with uh folks in data science and researchers uh in um, in Africa in particular, um, I'm forgetting the name of the gentleman who, um, presented at the Black and AI workshop in, uh, from Kenya. And yes, um, Chira. yeah, I think uh, the common thread through, you know, the things that you presented is this idea of applying these, um, yeah, actually, both of the projects, I think he was working on a similar uh, project with regard to, to natural resources, uh, mm-hmm. as well as kind of applying some of these methods to um, to kind of understudied populations. And I don't know, I, I, I guess the question that I'm kind of struggling with is, is you know, is a little bit of, is that uh, the fact that you're kind of both uh, working on similar things is that... Uh, to what degree is that kind of representative of the unique, you know, challenges that uh, are kind of expressing themselves in uh, African countries, you know, versus maybe a selection bias? That's what the organizers of Black and AI thought would be interesting. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I, but I think I actually had a little bit of a difference with the with a difference uh, of understanding with the work that uh, I think Shira uh, actually presented. I, I, I thought there was a lot of innovation in that because it's, it's understanding the resources that you have mm-hmm. uh, and having to make these processes work for you. So I have to say, and this is actually something I learned about when I moved here. There is a certain way that you work with these problems when, you know, you are in the U.S. and you have the resources. You've got all the computing resources and you've got, you know, other resources. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you move here and then you don't have as many resources. And the level, actually, like the innovation comes at that of trying to still do the same quality of work, mm. uh, but but at, at fairly low resources because the work still has to be done. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I actually really think that is, a, so we have two areas and of opportunity to contribute, I think, to, to you know, the, the scientific dialogue in the world. Number one is how do you do science when you don't have as many resources, but how do you do good, usable, useful science? And I think for us, that's the most important thing. We don't have the luxury of, you know, dwelling on the smallest of problems, like, okay, this is going to sound bad. I, my, I, please don't kill me on Twitter. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! But you know, like if I'm going to be asking for a grant, like the the level I am going to get questioned at, you know, like they, it's not just like there's all of this just a uh, uh, line there. So you have to learn how to work with 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 those things, and I think that's where innovation comes from. 
Because, in fact, then that sort of thing can be pushed back even to the developed world and say, no, you can actually do it with less resource. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, there isn't, you know, that can actually help. And there's been instances where this sort of thing has happened and processes have gotten removed because of that. Because, you know, as they say, what is it called? Deprivation is the mother of invention. I'm sure Mm -hmm. I've just made that up, but I think (laughs) the sentiment stays. Um, (laughs) Is is there a specific example that comes to mind? This is the beauty of interviewing somebody whose English is a second language, right? We make things (laughs) up. Uh, But anyway, so... (laughs) So that's the first thing. But the second thing is um, that we have very interesting problems. Like we have problems that actually you can make an impact on. Like just studying this data, however much we go through, Mm -hmm. um, you know, can make a difference. And and that's the luxury that we have. That's the thing that really motivates us. So I think, I mean, there's a lot of, um, of basic research that gets done here too. I mean, Amazon has a very very good lab in 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 Cape Town. Um, so that's work that's coming out of here. There is a lot of other labs actually that are running around. There's research institutes. Uh, even here at the CSI, there's a lot of basic basic work uh, that gets done. But um, like I said, I like applied work. So mm-hmm. I can't really say that generally captures the type of work that gets done here. But I do think we do more of that kind of work here. And I, and I think mm-hmm. you'll see maybe that same thing happening with maybe in Latin America also. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the, you know, the results you'll see coming out. Uh, and I think it's because we stand to truly make an impact. And, and it's, 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 it's really attractive to work in an area where you feel you can actually make an impact right. to a process to people's lives. Right. Outstanding. So. That's that's that. That's my walk around with yeah. that. <laughs> um, and so, what what are some of the other things? I came across a couple of other things that you've been involved in. I know last year there was the uh, the deep learning in Daba. Were you involved in that? Oh yes, yes, uh, yes. I was. I I was one of the organizers of the deep learning in Daba. I still am. Okay. Uh, and so for folks that aren't yeah. familiar with that, what was that? I was I was cheering you on from afar. Like, I, you know, I saw the tweets all the time and I was like, oh, man, I need to find a way to go to that and just never was able to make it happen. But it looked yes. like an awesome event. It was so great. So what happened is... Uh, uh, just a team of of friends. I think actually these are people that already knew each other from before. I mean, but overall, we all kind of also met all over Skype, and you know. Uh, but um, we, the whole purpose of the Indaba is to strengthen machine learning research in Africa. Um, so one of the big problem actually, it's not the problem of of of, of even computing resource. Sometimes the problem of human resource. Um, you know, mm-hmm. like building a team that's big enough to truly, you know, build that momentum. And um, so we wanted to find out uh, who else is here doing this work. It can be really difficult to find out who because mm-hmm. we are so sparse, you know, like placed all over. Right. Find out who's doing it. And for people that are interested, is there where we can capacitate them? So it was a, it was a summer school. I urge people to go check out our videos uh, on on YouTube um, and we managed to get a, you know, a lot of people that uh, actually this time around have um, uh, the main planning people were people that have their roots in Africa. These are Africans. Um, so we managed to all come together. Uh, and some of them were uh, in deep mind and some uh, somewhere in the U.S. and a lot were here in South Africa. And in the next year, so 2018 in Dubai is still going to happen in September, and we're looking even for even more Africans that are practicing in this area mm-hmm. because we don't want to have this idea that there are no Africans that are doing this work because then it's too far. It looks unreachable. It looks foreign, and it's not foreign. It's a technique that can be applied to our problems in our world. So we have been trying to find more Africans or I'm also trying to find experts, not just, you know, Af- of African descent, but other experts to come and teach and, 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 you know, just be around here. And it was a fantastic, fantastic event. Uh, we had Nando, we had Anima um, who just came. We had George from Brown, um, we had, and everybody was so, it was a, a really, really good, um, contagious. And, and I can tell you 
already the type of research and the kind of relationships, collaborations were formed just from that week. Um, mm -hmm. Like it really energized our work. Oh, that's great. Uh, uh, because even with the with the guys at Black in AI, I got to meet them because they saw that we were doing this in Dava. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I really have never worked with a like, nicer uh, planning committee. We, we generally, I don't know if they'll be mad at me for this, but we fight like crazy. Uh, but the nice thing is we are all interested in the same thing. Uh, and we work uh, like crazy too. So anyone that wants to work with us, wants to help us see this thing come true, uh, please, like we are always open. Uh, and, and that's what we want to do. We just want to strengthen African machine learning. We have very interesting problems in Africa because the dynamics are different. So if you mm -hmm. get a model in the U.S., it may not work here just because the dynamics are different. So we bring in a whole new way of turning around some of these theories and to get to understand how they may work in our environments. And we can't do that if we don't have truly fundamental knowledge of how these things work. Mm -hmm. We can't expand and stretch them to fit our problems if we don't fully understand how far they can stretch and expand. So that's why we want to embed like deep, deep, you know, theoretical knowledge so people can really grasp these concepts. And then I think then we can really do something for ourselves. Well, your passion for all of this is very uh, palpable, very tangible. <laughs> and I appreciate uh, you taking the time to, to chat with me about it. This is really fun, Sam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything else that you'd like to mention before we close out? Uh, I think maybe I'll actually go back to the whole thing of collaboration partners. If anyone uh, is interested in any of the things we said or has been interested in a problem that maybe they observed while they took you know, a, a trip down here uh, to South Africa or anywhere else uh, in Africa, we like collaborators. Um, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't necessarily, it need not be that we are, you know, we get isolated. So if there are people that are generally interested in working with some of these projects, one thing I can really tell them is they will, they, they are rewarding. The findings can be quite rewarding. Mm -hmm. And that we're always looking for collaborators because we don't also want to get myopic in how we understand our own problems. Perhaps looking at them from the outside can be a way to solve them. Mm. So. We're open to discussions. Great. And is there any particular best way for folks to connect with you? Uh, sure. They can get uh, in touch with me. I am on Twitter. Oh, I don't know if I should disclose who I am on Twitter, given the things I've said. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Woo, I'm on Twitter and my, my handle is uh, Ed Nunuska. That's the name my father gave me and it stuck. Uh, and okay. Nuska, so N U N U S K A. Uh, uh, so that's that. And then, of course, my email is uh, nmorosi.co.za. And, and maybe you can just uh, link that to the, to the link, uh, yep. to the web link. We'll link yeah. all that so stuff that, together that in the show notes. Okay, great. Yeah, no, that, if you just get in touch with me, if you want to get in touch with the Deep Learning Indaba too, please just link our link over there. It's deepleaningindaba.com. Um, if you want to get in touch with our committee, please check us out. Um, check, you know, maybe there's somebody they have always wanted to work with. Maybe you just like us. But anyway, yes, uh, I think awesome. collaboration is good. Yeah. Great. Well, Nyaling, thank you so much. Uh, and, uh, well, yeah, just thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Sam. Uh, this has been interesting. And uh, please, uh, you know, everybody, I'm always open for discussion. If I said something that was not in, that was not correct, please, you know, guide me in the right direction. That's what I said. Collaboration, conversation and exploration. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Remember, we want to hear your thoughts on personal AI. Head on over to twimlai.com slash myai to share. For more information on Yaling or any of the topics covered in this episode, or to share your feedback, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 109. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.